guys welcome to debate night uh, i have two very special guests uh, my new friend mark and my reoccurring friend matt matt is taking the uh positive position that belief in god is reasonable and mark is taking the position that belief in god is not reasonable so matt i'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you for your five minute opening statement all righty thank you james um, is belief, is it reasonable to believe in God? Uh, as a Christian, I believe absolutely it's reasonable to believe in God. In fact, I believe God is actually the foundation for reason itself. Uh, reason has to be assumed for an atheist because it can't be demonstrated to exist using something like the scientific method. It has to be philosophically assumed at the beginning. But how can an atheist even trust they have the cognitive faculties reliable enough to be reasonable? The answer is they can't. Uh, as C.S. Lewis argued, if thoughts are just accidental byproducts, how can we believe, believe them to be true? There is no reason to believe one accident can give a correct account of all the other accidents. It's like expecting that the accidental shape taken by the splash when you upset a milk jug should give you a correct account of how the milk jug was made and why it was upset. Uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, claims the universe we observe has no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. He claims that we are simply dancing to our DNA, which neither knows nor cares, and that theism is a delusion that was simply a byproduct of evolution for survival. <clears throat> so one could easily argue that atheism is also a byproduct to possibly even ensure our extinction as a species because of the damage that we have caused on Earth. So even from a purely natural scientific standpoint, theism could be easily argued as the most reasonable position. That, of course, after assuming reason exists to begin with, since science is incapable of demonstrating its existence. As a Christian, I know a lot of lots of different reasonable arguments that can lead one to conclude there is God. Arguments such as con con contingency arguments, something rather than nothing, ontological arguments, Cosmological arguments such as the Kalam, theological arguments such as fine tuning, Occam's razor, the existence of consciousness, moral arguments, uh, the existence of theism, personal experience and supernatural experiences that people have claimed to have across the world, uh, near death experiences that people have claimed to have. Uh, and for Christians specifically, personal revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible itself, the influence of Jesus Christ in history, and the Judeo-Christian ethics that saturate Western civilization, including the science, philosophy, and theology and law that we depend upon. So because I ground my reason in God, I can trust in him through his son. In fact, Jesus didn't just claim he, uh, we can know what is true, but actually claimed to be the truth that can set us free. Jesus I believe, is the truth and the foundation for all truths, lowercase. I would like uh, my opponent to explain how anything can really be true and therefore be able to support reason from a purely naturalistic, materialistic, blind, unguided Two process. minutes left. How come the, can the random splash of a milk carton, uh, a splash of a milk from an upset milk jug, explain how the milk jug was made and why it was upset to begin with? as C.S. Lewis referred as an example. To me, atheism would be the one lacking reason, not theism. As a Christian, I believe that the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is the beginning point of truth and reason because God is truth. Man's first experience began with God. When Adam began, became a living being, he was first introduced to his source of life and truth, God Almighty. The Bible teaches that from the mouth of babes and nursing infants, God has ordained praise. Jesus actually applies this Old Testament teaching to himself. Scripture teaches that God has put the desire of the eternal existence in the heart of man, Ecclesiastes 3.11. Even scientific studies suggest humans are actually predisposed to have religious beliefs, though they can't explain it from a purely naturalistic standpoint. Scripture teaches that Jesus Christ upholds the universe. Uh, Hebrews 1, 3, Colossians 1, 6, 
16 through 17, and that Jesus made all things um, and is the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So I believe that God is the source of reason and reason cannot exist without God. Jesus Christ is the foundation of all thought and the cornerstone or reference point in which all thoughts are judged. And that is my opening. All righty, Matt. Thank you very much for your opening statement. Uh, Mark, I'll, as soon as you begin talking, I'll put five minutes on the clock. Okay. I, I won't need nearly that much time. Um, I'm not one for monologuing uh, to, a, to a camera. Uh, so I'm just going to say that it's my position that it's unreasonable to believe a God exists because there is no evidence good enough to accept the proposition that a God exists, let alone specific gods exist. So the more specific Matt gets with his God, the, the easier it is going to be to show that, the, that there's no, it's not reasonable to believe in that. So that's my position. There's just not enough evidence and I'll concede the rest of my time. All righty. Uh, Matt, you have uh, five minutes going on to the clock where you will have a chance to uh, respond to his opening statement. And then Mark will get a chance to respond to your opening statement. You may begin. Okay, well, that was uh, very short. Uh, there's not a lot, I guess, for me to respond to right there. Um, I will just add one uh, little bit of information as far as what I believe makes the existence of God even more reasonable. And that would be the moral argument. I think the moral argument is one of the most difficult arguments for atheists to deal with when it comes to the existence of God. Um, atheists quite often will make objective moral statements uh, and claims, especially pertaining to the Bible when they say something like um, uh, slavery is always wrong. Uh, but then when you kind of press them on the issue, they'll say that morality is um, subjective. Um, philosophers have attempted, uh, non-theist philosophers have attempted to try to explain morality, uh, but have not done so well at doing that. Um, some have just, you know, considered morality as brute fact. I've seen uh, philosophers say, you know, it's, it's just brute fact that torturing babies are wrong. Um, so that's just they don't they can't really ground it in anything. Um, folks like Sam Harris has tried to argue um, human well-being is the objective moral standard for morality. Um, but he has difficulty grounding that uh, because ultimately, as uh, William Lane Craig pointed out in their debate, that um, even his standard would be subjective to the schoolyard bullies retort says who? Uh, so um, you have other arguments. Uh, Matt Dillahunty has attempted to argue that he has kind of ridden the coattails of Sam Harris and tried to argue well-being. Uh, but he says that experts can come to different conclusions about morality, and that's good. We should celebrate that. But then how can that be an objective moral standard, which he tries to argue for? Um, I've seen uh, uh, atheists argue the least imposition of will. Um, but the one who has argued this is actually for abortion and OK with abortion, which would mean based on his standard, an abortion would be the absolute most immoral thing one could do, because not only does it take away the, the human life, the baby in the womb's choice to live a life, it removes all the other choices, all the other willing choices that they would have made in their lifetime. Um, another example I've seen recently was an atheist who tried to argue morality is objective based on bodily autonomy, um, the, uh, uh, to, uh, it, to not violate bodily autonomy. That's how we ground our objective moral standards. So I responded, well, that would mean every law on the book that prevents people from doing something with their body would be considered immoral, wouldn't it? Uh, and he conceded that. He actually admitted that. Uh, such as someone who decides I'm going to go drink excessively and get in my car and drive down the road drunk. The, it would actually be based on his standard immoral for the cop to actually pull them over and write them a ticket or put them in jail because they, uh, it was violating their bodily autonomy because that's what they wanted to do with their body. So as you can see, these arguments for morality 
easily, I think, fall apart. A minute apart. And 30 and, left. And I think it, it's, it's one of the difficult issues for uh, atheists um, to deal with. Um, and I have actually seen atheists, they will argue that unintentionally, they will argue the objective moral standard when it comes to God. Uh, but when pressed on the issue, they'll go, well, morality is just relative or subjective to certain situations. So they kind of undermine their own argument. Just, but this just this week, I had an atheist um, talk about how um, we were talking about, I forget what this is, probably slavery. Uh, but he, he said, well, this is supposed to be the divine inspired word of God. So he was unintentionally actually acknowledging that if there was a God, then there would be a higher standard for morality than what we humans uh, can obtain, uh, which I would agree with. I mean, I think God is the objective moral standard. And I think because we have this idea, the Bible teaches this idea is innate to us, that we, we have the law written in our hearts, uh, as Romans says, as Paul says in Romans. And I believe this is evidence uh, for the existence of God and and continues to add to the reasonable arguments for the existence of God. And, uh, and that is he, time. Okay. All right, Mark, I'm setting five minutes on the clock. You'll be able to respond okay. to Matt's opening statement. All right. I, uh, I'm going to use again. a little bit of time here. Uh, unlike my opening statement, I'll use a little bit of time here. So Matt said that God is the foundation for reason. Um, that's a pretty good, uh, that's an assertion he's going to have to prove. Um, we know logic and reason are dependable because we've demonstrated logic and reason to be dependable. As far as the foundation for logic and reason, we just presuppose logic and reason. It's no different than if you would be presupposing God, but you'd have an extra step to uh <clears throat> to prove that there is that God and then demonstrate that God, we can demonstrate logic and reason. Um, Matt also brought up some quotes from Richard Dawkins and uh, Matt, Matt Dillahunty, which I think are great. If you're going to debate Richard Hawkins or Matt Dillahunty, you can ask them about those quotes. I didn't say those quotes, so I have no reason to defend them. Um, but anytime you're having a discussion with those guys, please feel free to uh, use those quotes with them. Uh, he brought up contingency, which why is there something rather than nothing? I would challenge Matt to actually tell me what nothing is. What is nothing? So you'd have to explain to me what nothing is. How can there ever be nothing? As soon as you ascribe qualities, it's then something. So then it would be something coming from something. You can't, ever, there can never be nothing. So you would have to describe to me nothing. And uh, I think it'd be pretty hard pressed to do that. Um, and then Kalam's uh, is another argument that we can get into in our open discussion. Uh, but basically for people who don't know Kalam's, it, it's for anything that begins to exist has a beginning, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a beginning. But what, what theists like Matt like to do is they like to special plead their God in as the beginning. You can't just special plead that in there. You have to then demonstrate that your God was the beginning as opposed to any of the other naturalistic explanations we have for it, which uh, can be demonstrated. Um, I'm not a cosmologist, so my understanding of Big Bang cosmology is very rudimentary, um, but you know I have a, a a, disti a distinct, did I just say clums? Yes, I did. <clears throat> am, I, am I wrong on clums? <laughs> Anyways, um, it, it's very rudimentary, but you know, I, I could talk about Big Bang cosmology a very little bit amount, but I don't really want to get stuck on hard cosmology. Um, but that's all the points he made in his opening that I wanted to address, and uh, we can go from there. Alrighty, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, Matt, this will be your chance to ask five minutes of hot questions. You may begin. Okay. Um, let's see if I can. Buy. Do you believe that truth is absolute? What do you mean by absolute? Meaning that it's not based on anyone else's opinion, that there's a standard of truth that exists outside of our own personal opinions. So let me define what I think truth is for you. What I think truth is, truth is that which comports with reality. So if it comports with reality, it's true. Okay. Um, so if it comports with reality, it's true. And that's, uh, let's use an example of someone who says they were born, they were born a male, a biological male, but mm -hmm. they say that they've always felt like there was a woman trapped inside their body. 
Uh, would you say that comports with reality, their reality? Do you really want to have this conversation? No, I mean, you just, I'm just wondering, you said if it comports with reality. Do you think do you, that would comport with their reality? Is that, is that really the point you want to go down? You really want to go down transgenderism in a debate about is God reasonable? No, I wanted to, well, it's my turn to ask, ask the question. So I'm just asking you, does this comport with their I'm reality? I'm going to refuse to answer that question. Okay. Um, it's, next it's question. irrelevant. Can you know as an atheist that your thoughts are true and can be reasonable? And if so, how so? If they comport with reality, if, if I can demonstrate that something comports with reality, then yes, it is reasonable and true. But I have to be able to demonstrate its, its correspondence with reality. Like I could say I have 20 snakes behind me and then show you 20 snakes. It comports with reality. Therefore, it's true. OK, and we um, know that. Um, how can a blind, unguided process that brought um, that it brought forth this observable universe can bring consciousness that which is required for reason i mean how can an unconscious process bring about something that is conscious which is required for reason to begin with well as best we know consciousness is an emergent property of our of our minds and it, it's it's available in all of the orders of apes that have have a mind us chimpanzees do you, do you think yeah, do you think apes and stuff use reason? They, they do, yes. They have a theory of mind. Okay. Um, can reason be tested in a lab or is it just presupposed? Can reason? I don't think you. I, I think you had already said it was presupposed. Yeah, I mean, it is presupposed, okay. but I mean, you can okay. test. You could test logic and reason to see if it leads to, to accurate results. I mean, that's okay. why logical syllogisms exist, right? Okay. Well, what would reason look like in a lab what? under lab conditions? Well, I mean, it wouldn't be necessarily like a scientific lab like you see on the movies. It okay. would be like you and I would set forth a problem. We would use logic and reason to figure it out. And if it comports with reality, we know logic and reason works. Okay. Uh, if you had proof that Christianity and the Bible is true, would you become a Christian? No. Okay. Um, is morality absolute? Um, yes and no. So reality is you and I can agree on a basis for, for morality, correct? Um, let's say you and I agreed on a basis for morality. The basis of the agreement you and I came to would be subjective, but then we can make objective decisions of morality based on that basis you and I agreed to. Okay. Do you have free will or is it just an illusion? I honestly don't know. I struggle with that every day. Okay. <laughs> I, okay. I'm, I'm just being honest. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, that, that's keeps fine. keeps me up um, at night. <laughs> yeah, that, I, I know that uh, folks like Sam Harris and them say that we do not. It's just an illusion. So I was just wondering what your thoughts are. I'd um, love to think I have free will and that I'm a cognitive agent and that I am making the decisions. I would love to think that, but I, I just don't know. Now, if, if you don't know that you have free will, then how can you know that reason exists? Because wouldn't re free will be required to be reasonable? Because you'd have to be able to change your mind based on new information. No, I mean, free, reason exists without free will because reason is still, it, it, let's say you and I don't have free will right now. Because I mean, I could argue under the Christian model, you, you don't have free will. If God knows everything that's going to happen to you before he even makes you, where is your will to do anything different than God has planned for you? So okay. I could argue that so, you don't have free will. Yeah, um, uh, but I'm just wondering if you kind of have to presuppose free will, I believe, in order to say that you can be reasonable. And that's why I'm, I'm wondering how you, uh, you can even say it's unreasonable to be a uh, believer, a Christian, or a, a theist when you're not even sure if uh, free will exists in order right, to be Matt, reasonable. That is time. Um, Mark, okay. uh, whenever you're ready, I'll start your time. Your chance to ask Matt five minutes of questions. Okay. Matt, what is nothing? Um, I would describe nothing as nothing. There's, n I mean, there's no properties, nothing at all. Um, I can't even comprehend what nothing is really, to be honest with you. So is it but, safe to, would you agree that nothing is uh, improbable to exist? Um, yeah, I don't think, I don't think it's possible for nothing to exist. Okay. So then the argument you made that something cannot come from nothing, then it wouldn't necessarily be a good argument if nothing can never exist. Well, when you have um, when you have scientists that write books that say a universe from nothing, 
and then they try to define what they mean by nothing. I think that's a bad word to use when in the whole book they're trying to say that there's something that created right. or that brought about the universe. So sure. yeah, I think I think nothing is kind of a um, uh, a w unnecessary wor word when it comes to the existence of the physical world. Now, I mean, I can comprehend zero, you know, in a mathematical problem, sure. uh, you know, what zero is. And I guess nothing in zero could be very, uh, you know, similar, but I can't really comprehend what nothing is. Okay. Do you believe that the Bible is true and inerrant word of God? Uh, yes. <clears throat> so do you believe that Noah's flood happened? Yes. How do we have, if, if Noah's flood happened and it landed on a, a mountain in the Middle East, right? Is that what everyone believes? Uh, when, when yeah, I ball? think so. Uh, somewhere how, on, yeah. How do we have kangaroos in Australia? Well, I believe according to scripture, if you look later on about, I believe it's um, Genesis chapter 9 or mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 10, it's, it's naming off the generations and there was a specific person named Peleg, P-L-E-G. And it said he was named that because in his generation, the land was divided. So I can't really know for sure because that the Bible doesn't give specifics on that. Mm -hmm. But my view is if God can can take care of Noah in a flood, I don't think he'd have a problem ensuring that the kangaroos get to where they they need to be. So um, and, and it could be that the land mass was just one land mass at that time, which would kind of kind of demonstrate what uh, science says as well. It. it it wasn't. Also, there is a paper. I forgot the name of the doctor, but he's a creationist who said that the energy released during the flood would still leave the earth today molten lava that would be uninhabitable. We're talking scorched earth. How are we still alive on earth if all of that displaced energy would make earth uninhabitable today? You said a, creation, a creationist said that? Yep, a creationist said that. His, yeah, I, his, I'll I, tell you his justification for it, but... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've never heard a creationist actually say. I've seen a lot of creationists argue, but that's not yeah. one thing that they've, he, they've never argue, his, ever argued. His conclusion was we just have to get used to the idea that God can violate physics. Do you believe that God can violate physics? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> okay. But then yeah. he would he, – he would he would leave traces of violating physics. What examples do we have where God violated physics and can and can demonstrate that? What do you mean? What traces? You mean he would leave traces? There would be we, there would have this thing that we could say, look, physics didn't make sense right here. Where, where do we have an example of that? Well, we have a lot of people that even doctors saying that there's things that happen that they can't under they can't explain that are unexplainable. So I, you know, I don't know what you mean by what. Uh, well, what I mean, evidence. if you're saying that something is unexplainable and, but you're going to insert God into it, that's just, uh, that's an argument. Well, from ignorance. Yeah. I mean, they, they didn't, the, even the doctors don't even insert God. I mean, there's that there's uh, out of body experiences where people claim to have been able to, when they were unconscious or their heart was not beating, they were, did we lose you? Tomorrow, I think we may have lost Mark for a moment. I'm going to try to pop him back in, guys. Okay. One second. All right. Okay. So Mark, Sorry. You... I, I disconnected. Remind no, me no, where I was. So, um, you were, uh, I was. Nine seconds back to the time, too, guys. So, Mark, you have another minute. Um, you were... I, I don't have any questions for Matt. We can just jump into open conversation. Uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm reaching for questions at this point. Okay. <laughs> nope. That, that sounds fine. All right, guys, I'm setting the timer for 20 minutes. Open discussion. If there's any questions from the audience, we'll take those after the open discussion and then we'll do the five minute closing statements. Okay. You guys may begin. Matt, you can start okay. off. Uh, well, I, I think kind of my view and I, and I'll kind of reiterate what I was saying in my opening statement, I believe, and I, I'm not sure, I think it's kind of common sense myself that if hypothetically speaking from your perspective, if God exists, if there is a creator of everything, then that creator, everything would be foundational to that creator. Everything that we, we know would be based on that creator and that we could ground our reasoning and our trust in that creator to give us the cognitive abilities 
to be able to reason. And in scripture, it talks about um, Jesus uh, says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He includes mind for a purpose. And I believe that we can trust our minds to understand the creation that he's given us. Uh, and I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Hypothetically, from your perspective, wouldn't that seem to make sense? Well, if you're talking about scripture, my immediate response would be, why should I care what scripture says? Well, I mean, you wouldn't have to care what scripture says. But, but why just, should why should we believe it? Why should I believe scripture? The scripture is true. Why should you believe it? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't. I'm not really here to tell you why you should believe it. I can tell you why well, I believe it. If, but if you, but mean, that's the same thing, right? I mean, have, why? It, have you ever been a Christian? Have you ever? No. Okay, you've been an atheist your whole life. Yeah. Okay. Now, how did you? Uh, come to identify as an atheist well no one lied to me and told me about god as a child so i just had no concept of it well if you say no one lied to you then you just you would just say that god does not exist and wouldn't that be uh a, a claim yourself no what i'm saying is well i mean my claim with that christianity is untrue. I, I'm more than willing to take that claim on, but no one indoctrinated me as a child into a specific religion. So I had no religion as a child. And as I thought about it as an adult, it just didn't make sense to me. When I say that no one lied to me, I'm obviously being uh, hy hyperbolic for, okay. for effect. Now, what, uh, at what point in your life did you start, you know, reflecting does God exist? What made you do that? Well, I mean, you interact with other kids that tell you about this, you know, this thing, Jesus and God, and it, it just never made sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. The whole fantastical part of it and spiritual part of it just never, never made sense to me, never clicked in my brain. And, you know, the more I think about it, the less sense it makes uh, in terms of uh, a reasonable proposition. Okay. So, um, what would make sense to, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you accept evolution and all of that. Is that what makes more sense to you? Well, evolution is independent of the God debate, right? So um, yeah. it, God can exist and evolution can exist simultaneously. So evolution doesn't really have a role to play in the debate. Um <clears throat> It's just like for me, when you when you read the Bible and you see all the errors that the Bible makes, uh, for example, the, it, the Bible talks about things with four legs that fly that should be de detestable to you. There, there's no such creature on this planet that has uh, four limbs and flies. Um, you know, birds have yeah, two, insects have six. Right. There's yeah, nothing. You're, you're talking about the locust and grasshopper where it's. Um... Uh, if you actually observe a locust or a grasshopper moving on something smooth, what they actually do is they take their four legs and they drag these four legs and then they use their two back legs to leap. The back legs are just kind of there for leaping. And I think Moses actually gave a pretty good description there of how the how how a grasshopper actually um, functions. Uh, but I, th I know a lot of people because he used the word moves moves along on four legs kind of say, oh, well, Moses is saying that it only had four legs. I don't think Moses was saying that. I think Moses is describing how this grasshopper actually functions. I think it's a bit of massaging because grasshoppers clearly have six legs. There's also the, the, the cow looking at striped patterns bearing striped calf. Um, you have plants existing before the sun in Genesis. Um, you have well, the, the mustard. The, the mustard seed is the smallest seed that you put in the ground when it's not even close to the smallest seed. Uh, there, there's too many errors in the Bible for it to be an inerrant word of God. There's just there's a lot of errors there, and I can't I can't well, accept as, it as an inerrant word. Yeah, as far as the the striped sheep, um, actually, if you read more of that passage, Jacob was also actually taking some of the weaker animals and bre and making sure the, the stronger ones bred with his and producing these spotted, I can't remember if it was spotted or striped. And then he puts these, um, these plants in front of them. I don't really know. The Bible doesn't explicitly say that that is what caused the sheep to have these stripes or these spots, but it does specifically also talk about Jacob using these breeding tactics of taking the stronger and breeding it together. So I don't think that's necessarily, I mean, to me, that almost seems like 
something, someone who accepts evolution would actually be okay with because this, these sheep seem to be in, adapting to their, their environment. Uh, and I have heard that sheep stripes are on animals for a, as a survival mechanism. I don't know that for sure. I'm no, I'm no uh, biologist. Well, by it no was means, talking but. about cows in, in that, in that situation. And, you know, I selectively, no, breed. no, it was, it was sheep. It you sure? Cheaper, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll defer to you on that one. Yeah. I selectively breed, so I understand selectively breeding for mm -hmm. uh, for patterns and and specific uh, phenotypical qualities. Um, but these things, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that if they're looking at a pattern, they will resemble the pattern that they are looking at, which you and I know is not correct. That's not how genetics well, works. Yeah, it doesn't just say that. It also talks about him selecting the stronger over the weaker and breeding them in that passage as well. So there's kind of, there's more than just that that was going on. But there. those aren't phenotypical traits, right? So um, you're not talking about phenotypes when you're talking about breeding stronger versus weaker. They could still have the same phenotypes and, and uh, produce the same phenotypes. You're talking about, you know, muscle mass and things like that, which would then, you know, pass down. But I'm talking about visual traits, which are phenotypes. Yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by that, because uh, I do know um, that as far as that passage goes, I, there's a lot more to it than just what you're saying here. So I, I'm not sure that that you could argue that 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 is something that's unscientific. But that that leads me to my next question. Um, do you think science deals in uh, absolute truth or can prove things? Uh, as far as I know, logic is the only thing we can use to prove things. Um, I don't think science even aims to prove anything. Uh, science just ends to demonstrate and uh, show, you know, the best possible outcomes and positions. Uh, so I, I generally I wouldn't use science to prove anything. I would use science to, uh, to demonstrate, like, for example, with evolution, um, you know, science could show you how everything lined up. And it, it, and it evolved and it is our best working model, um, but it is not necessarily an absolute model because there's still okay. things we don't know about evolution. So, t so based on that, I mean, going back to the examples you were using earlier that were, I, I, I was under the impression you were saying they were unscientific uh, in nature, such as Jacob breeding the sheep and the, I forget the other examples that you used, uh, but if God exists, as I believe, then uh, why would that be something that would be illogical? It, it would violate what we know about genetics and biology, right? Um, but that would, but that would be science. And if science can't prove things, then and science doesn't but it can't deal with demonstrate the things, of, right? Yeah. So if I put some of my animals together, I know exactly what I'm going to get out of that, right? Like, it, it's not a guessing game. I'm not just like, oh, I think I'm going to get this. I know exactly what's going to happen there. It's based not, on your based on your own intellectual knowledge and your own will to well, it's how be genetics involved works. here, right? Yeah. You know, so, you, get, you get one copy of a gene for mom, one copy of a gene for dad. Sometimes they code on the same locus of the chromosome. Sometimes they don't. And when they code on the same locus, you can get one effect. And if they chrome, uh, if they code on different locuses, you'll get different effects. Right. So I, you, you could calculate how these genes are going to pass down in a Punnett square and your outcome will match what the yeah. expectation was. Yeah, I don't really have a problem with that. What I'm saying is these passages in scripture that you were having a problem with on a scientific level, if science doesn't prove things and then we add God into that element, then I don't understand why that would be those passages would be an issue. I mean, I mean, hypothetically, they don't comport with what we would expect in reality. Well, we're also talking about God. So God sometimes do does things it doesn't comport with. I mean, take Joseph and Mary, for example. I mean, why was Joseph wanting to divorce Mary? Because it didn't usually comport with reality that a virgin would get pregnant. So Joseph assumed that she had committed adultery with someone else. And, and so he was going to divorce her privately because he, he didn't want to uh, disgrace her. But he was actually understanding as you were saying, th certain things comport with reality. That's why the angel actually had to say, no, Joseph, this is, you, you, he, he told Joseph specifically that to take Mary, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. So the, even the Bible itself on, you know, teaches that there's certain 
there's patterns we can observe in reality and things. But then sometimes when a miracle happens, those patterns do kind of they, they get upset uh, for a, during that right. miracle. But you'd have you have a long leap to go to proving that actually happened. Right. And it's not just a story. Well, I, that, yeah, that I could barely easily just be fiction. Right. I, yeah, I don't think you can prove miracles. I don't think you can't take the sure scientific tech. How? Cut my arm off and ask God to grow it back. And that would be proof to you, but that wouldn't how, be the how scientific would that method. Happen? That wouldn't be the scientific method. I mean, that, that, would that would be would you. certainly be a miracle. Actually, why why now, doesn't would God you, heal amputees, actually? That, that's something I'd like to know. Why doesn't God heal amputees? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I can't answer that question, but I do know that God does heal amputees of animals. I mean, a lizard loses his tail, the tail can grow back. Well, that's uh, not other, God healing other, it. That's, that's a regenerative function well, I be, of I be, those animals. So if if you prayed... And not every and this, lizard does that, by the way. And if, okay, if you if your arm got cut off and it mm-hmm. you prayed and it regenerated like a lizard, would you say that was a miracle? Uh, I would say that it... Well, I mean, it depends on what your definition of miracle is. I wouldn't know what well, did it. That but would violate. Uh, it, you said it, it, course, it, it would, it would violate that, everything right? we know about science. Correct. But yeah. I mean, well, that, it, that it, would it, be it, a point. In, I mean, that might be a point in your camp. But I mean, when when that actually happens, we'll talk about it. But I mean, that's how you could demonstrate something to me. Like so, I cut my arm off and then it grows back. How, so how did I, that happen? I, I think you're kind of uh, you're kind of demonstrating the importance of miracles here because you're acknowledging that you would want to see this happen. And in the Bible, that's what it was. These people saw these miracles take place and they uh, understood this does not comport with my reality. This is something new. There's naturalistic explanations for these things that aren't miracles, right? So if we're taking the Joseph and Mary uh, example, Mary had sex with another man. Like, it's just that simple. You can explain that without a miracle. That's what Joseph thought, yeah. Joseph right. thought so, that Mary had so that's why the angel had to come and say, "Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, uh, because this is, is this is of God." But again, there, there's a naturalistic explanation for that, right? Mary had sex with another man, right? Yeah, and if I mean, we're you, using you, Occam's razor, that would tell us that that is the most likely scenario there. So we don't we don't have to call that a miracle. Uh, sex produces well, I, babies. I, I think and there Occam, was Occam's baby. I think Occam's razor actually destroys atheism because if if you look at if you look at Occam's razor, it's kind of the simplest uh, uh, explanation for things, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and if you go with something like um, an unguided, unnatural, accidental, um, immense uh, singularity that brought forth the universe accidentally, unnaturally, and then everything just evolved into what we are talking apes today. There's a lot of elements going into that that I think actually would violate Occam's razor. And therefore, I think Occam's razor is actually more damaging to atheism or the naturalistic explanation that it would would be for God. You're more than just talking apes. We're talking apes with anxiety. Can't forget about that part. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah. But I mean, so. As far as that goes, I mean, you're you're solving a mystery, right? Because the uni- the the, uh, the beginning of the universe is a mystery, right? You're solving that mystery by appealing to another mystery, right? I, I don't think that's how you find truth. Well, I mean, you're you're still you've got a starting point here with God. With with the other, you have no starting point. We and have then, we don't know yet. Yeah, and uh, at least we have a starting point. And I believe because I don't know I how that puts you on a strong. I don't know how that puts you in a stronger footing. I can make up a uh, pink and purple unicorn that started the universe. Now I have a starting point. Well, once you do that, then you would be acknowledging that the atheistic position would be less rational because you're actually having to bring in a supernatural explanation for the. No, starting it's not. A, it's not a. It's not a god or a Christian. So god. you would be retreating. From the atheist. I mean, it, but it's not a, it's not a, it's not a cognitive agent. It's not a one that cares about what I do in this world. It, it's just, you know, it's a pink and purple unicorn that farted the universe into existence and it went on its way. And, so uh, that, yeah, but that I mean, but that's, but I don't I see I, what you're I, saying, but I don't hold that position, but I'm saying I could say that and then have a starting point And then where are we? But don't you think once you have to move to saying something like that, then you're actually acknowledging that the naturalistic explanation isn't good enough. Everything else could be naturalistic except for that one thing. And uh, pink and purple yeah, unicorn could I be agree, natural, yeah. but 
But I'm just saying is I could just say that and then I, I have a starting point. It, so it's, just as, it's just as rational as the Christian got at that point because I don't have any evidence. You don't have any evidence. We're, we're just stuck. Well, I wouldn't say it was rational because you said it wouldn't have to have consciousness or will or any care whatsoever. Nope. So it may not even produce any Didn't even intend ability. to. It, just, it, yeah, it produced it, this universe and everything else is an accident. So it would – there's no guarantee it would love anything in the universe and therefore care if anything in the to. universe even knew what was reasonable or truth wouldn't even need to exist technically. I mean, if people well, could just go doing whatever they wanted to do and it I wouldn't don't know, really matter. I don't know where love comes into it, but I, I don't think that's necessary for a creation of a universe. Do you, do you believe love is an emergent property? It's a chemical reaction in our brain. It hits hard and fades fast. Okay. So, um, so any interaction you have with someone you love is just simply a chemical reaction in the brain and you never mm -hmm. chose you never chose to love them. Yeah, I don't even know if I if I made the choice to to love a anyone in my life that I end up loving. I mean, did you choose to love your wife? Uh yes. So because it was a I choice. Believe, it just, it I just didn't I believe happen. I believe choice I believe there are some emotional connections that people have, which can be some chemical reactions in the brain. But I also believe love is more than just a chemical reaction. I believe it's actually also active, actively loving someone. I, th so I mean, you could choose to not love your wife or your kids uh, or. Yeah, I think you, I think someone could be very selfish and decide not to have any self-sacrificial love whatsoever and just live their life completely all about them okay. and, and slowly, let their kids and their wives just fade off into, you know, it'd be all about me, a self-centered life. I think love comes with some, some sacrifices. I, I, mean, I agree. Yeah. Love is sacrifice. There's a lot of, but I mean, that that's relevant to the, the Christian debate. One thing I forgot to have you do, Matt, and I, I probably should have done this beginning. I, I need you to define God for me. Uh, I believe God is, uh, let's see, maximally powerful being, who uh, uh, creator of the universe, the foundation and starting point of everything that we we know. And I believe God is love. And I and by the way, as a Christian, I believe that Jesus Christ himself is God in the flesh. So you're a Trinitarian. Yes. <clears throat> OK, but like but OK, so you told me attributes of God, but not necessarily what God is. Well, I believe God, as far as the Trinitarian, I believe um, there is God, and then there's the there's the being of God, and then the three persons of God: God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They all encompass who God is. As far as being able to really define God in human levels, I, the only thing, the best thing I could say is just a maximally powerful, all powerful, Almighty. The Bible calls him the Almighty. Uh, mm -hmm. That's probably the best way to describe him because uh, humans so can't really describe God, I think, in if, in terms that we fully understand. <clears throat> so if you can't describe it, can't understand it, why should we believe it exists? If well, you I can't even I, tell me what it is. I didn't say that you couldn't understand. or I mean, you can't fully understand God, but we can know God. We can have a relationship with God through but Jesus you're, Christ. You're, you're telling me this thing exists, right? But you can't tell me what it is you you can't logically explain this thing to me so if you can't put a logical explanation no, I, to this thing why should i believe it exists I, I think ultimately logic i think if we could fully if we had more ability to comprehend god i think we could see logic but i think in our human limitations sometimes our logic and our logic breaks down but actually because i'm a christian i believe that logic is God. So when we say uh, it, in, in John chapter one, it said in the beginning was the word and the word was God and, and the word, word was with God and he created everything through him. All things were created. That uh, term is also logos. So I believe that logic in order to even say logic exists, I believe we have to have the foundation of logic, which I believe is ultimately Jesus Christ. And that's what the Bible, the Bible claims. But I, some, there are certain things I cannot fully, as a human, explain. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can't even explain physical things. Do we really think we can what physical put the thing creator we in a, describe? 
Well, I mean, earlier we were talking about Lawrence Krauss trying to write a book saying a universe from nothing. And he, he's, his, his language breaks down in trying to figure out what nothing is. Well, you, um, could, you could see how he would use nothing in a sensational way to sell books, right? Like he yeah. doesn't actually mean nothing in the way that you, you would think All nothing right, is guys. implied. That is time. That was a fast 20 minutes. Wow, um, that was quick. I have a friend who's coming in because I'm having some internet problems. He's going okay. to ask you guys the questions and yeah. then get you into the closing. Matt, I want to say I enjoyed this um, talk without, a lot more than I thought I would. Yeah, I, I, I'm always I, a good guy to get along with. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you coming in. Um, before we do do questions, let's go ahead and... Uh, plug what you guys are doing and then I'll introduce Richard. Go uh, ahead, Mark. Matt, I'm, I'm not, do, I'm not, okay. yeah, I'm not doing anything really. So, <laughs> oh, so you want I'm, to plug I'm, what I'm doing? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, yeah. So real quick, what I do is, you know, I, I do these debates just for fun. I'm not like a philosopher or anything like that. What I am is just, uh, I breed reptiles, um, ball pythons, uh, new Caledonia geckos, if people really want to see them, I'll pulse them out. I don't care. Um, but uh, I, I, have a, I have a reptile channel. I just started Pantheon uh, Pantheon Reptiles on YouTube where I show off, you know, I got some clutches coming out of ball pythons in a couple of weeks. I, I show off my crested geckos and stuff like that. And uh, that's my passion is reptiles. And uh, I was hoping we would, we would get, that would bring up uh, evolution a little bit more because I could show something really cool on snakes that kind of leans towards evolution. But uh, we didn't go down that path. All righty. And uh, for those who don't know, this is my good friend, Richard Madsen. He has a channel, Demolish Doctrine. Uh, consider checking that out. Richard, I'm going to pop myself out, and then it looks like there's more questions coming. Uh, feel free to go. Uh, Mark, I was just making sure Mark wasn't leaving. Okay. No, I'm just going to get a friend with me. We'll, we'll, we'll pull out a friend here. Oh, is that that's a ball python, yeah? Yeah. Nice. Beautiful color. Thank you. All right, guys, you guys ready to get into the questions from the uh from the live audience there? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Sure. So James has copied and pasted these into a, a Facebook chat, and I'll just be reading from there. So I won't be able to see your faces. I'm just gonna be reading the questions. <laughs> you don't need to see my face anyways, it's not that special. <laughs> Okay. Uh, first question. I'm just going to read them in the order they're in. Just uh, however they however they go. I'm not going to try to like go every other person or anything like that. Question for Mark. Uh, you said you rejected the Kalam argument. Could you steel man the Kalam argument from its strictly philosophical sense, please? That was from the EA show or Justin Downing. So steel manning the Kalam's argument is I, I don't reject the Kalam's argument outright. I reject the conclusion that God is the cause in the Kalam's argument. Um, the Kalam's argument is just saying that the universe has a cause at the beginning of it based off of if it began to exist, which we don't know that. Also, um, so if the universe begins to exist, um, it, it would have a cause for that. Uh, the universe began to exist, so the universe has a cause. So that that's basically what it's saying is that there is a cause at the beginning of the Kalam's argument. However, what I reject is the special pleading that God is that cause, just sliding that in there. That's what I don't agree with. Okay, would both of you agree or disagree to the other person getting a chance to respond if the question applies to you both? If Matt wants to respond, I don't care. That's fine. Matt, did you like to respond to the question already posed? Oh uh, yeah, I I just think the Kalam. I think it's reasonable to because to put God there as a Christian. I think it 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 works perfectly with my Christian worldview. So I think it's reasonable on my position to do that. Um, now I know atheists disagree, but I think the Kalam argument is one of the best arguments for the existence of God. But that's that's I'm no expert on it. I I it it's I enjoy watching William Lane Craig debate it and others. But it's not something that it's not something that actually brought me to be a, a believer, a, a theist and then a Christian. So but it is a good argument, I think. And uh, those in the side chat, write your questions. James will copy and paste them for me as I read them off because I want someone to ask a question aside from Justin Downing of the EA show. Question for Matt. How do you solve the logical problem of the Trinity where there is an apparent contradiction of identity? Well, uh, from my view, and I know Justin, if I have talked about this before, 
I don't, I would not say that there's a logical problem with the Trinity. I think that I can't wrap my brain to, around it and explain it maybe using um, logic at the moment, but that doesn't mean that there's a logical problem with it. Uh, I believe that because I'm a Christian, I think the Trinity best explains how God can take on flesh, uh, dwell among man, demonstrate his love physically to man uh, by humbling himself to become you know, Jesus said, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you must be servant of all. Uh, Jesus, God the Son, demonstrated how that can be done and demonstrated demonstrates his love. And God can do this without God ever actually losing his power and authority. And, and that's the, uh, I think the Trinity is the best way to explain that. But I cannot really explain it in logical terms because sometimes I end up going into saying things that aren't really uh, that the, the Bible doesn't teach. So I'm basically uh, relying on what scripture itself teaches. If I go outside of scripture and I end up um, conflicting with scripture, then I'm wrong. Scripture's not wrong. I'm wrong. And that's, that's uh, how I would answer that. And um, surprise, surprise. The next question. Can I sorry. just jump in real quick about the Trinity? Yes, sir. Like 10 seconds. Um, for me, the Trinity is, I believe, the most unreasonable part of this whole thing. The idea that that God sends down a version of himself to sacrifice himself to himself to act as a loophole for rules that he could just change and, and that he made at any time is just, for me, the most unreasonable part of the whole story. Okay, and the next question, again, from Justin Downing of the EA Show, a question for Mark. Okay. Uh-oh. You which is why I'm begging for other people to write questions, please. Not that his <laughs> questions are bad in any way. Uh, look out, the man's been studying philosophy. Question for Mark. You stated that consciousness is an emergent property of the brain. How do you solve the hard problem of consciousness when there's no scientific theories to back up your claim? I, well, I mean, if it's a hard problem, then no one can, right? And, and I said, as best we know, um, I, I'm not making a hard, I, I don't know. I, it's not my, my area of expertise. I, I don't study neurology or anything like that. I said, as best we know, it's an emergent property of our brain. Uh, but it's like, you know, it's like hard solipsism. We just, sometimes we just have to, uh, I can't prove I'm not a vein in a, in, a, in a vat, but I'm bound by this reality that I cannot prove it. So I just have to live in this reality that I'm in regardless. Um, I, just like I, I can't prove consciousness, uh, it's a hard problem. No one can. And Matt, did you want to comment? Uh, no, I think I think uh, I agree with him. It's something that uh, Christian or atheists cannot. Uh, it's a hard problem for atheists, is what it is. I think for you can't prove it either. <laughs> for theists, well, we have an explanation. We have a grounding for consciousness in God. Uh, but atheists do not have that. So I think Christians do have the advantage there. But I do agree we can't prove it using a scientific method. <clears throat> All right. And the next question from, I'm going to say this poorly, Bob Gumkowski. Bobby. Uh, for for um, from Matt, is God within space and time? Um, God can manifest himself within space and time, but he's not... He's not, it, the scripture says God is spirit and those who worship God must worship him in spirit. And that's one of the reasons why I think the Trinity uh, can work because we don't really understand how spirit actually works. But I, uh, my answer is, is God in space and time? God can be in space and time, but God's not limited to space and time. So, uh, you know, we believe that God is omnipresent. So God exists, God's presence exists everywhere. So, so again, it's something I can't, fully comprehend because I'm a human who's limited to time, space, and matter. Uh, Can so anything that's about exist the best outside thing. of space and time? Yeah. How, God, how do you exist without God, how do you, but how do you exist without space or time? A human I don't think can. But <clears throat> you would be saying like these are the properties that are required to exist, right? But then your God doesn't need any of those properties to exist. Well, I will okay. say that I, we'll, I we'll take, gentlemen, we'll take that challenge. And uh, Mark and Matt are welcome to schedule another debate on James' okay. channel <laughs> at some other time. But for now, if we could get right. through the questions from shut the live Shut it down. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm trying to be nice, but yes, shut it down. All right. <laughs> All right. Follow up from Bob Gumkowski. How do you know that it's a God? 
who's he asking? Me? Uh, that would same, be for you. It's a follow-up. Well, I mean, for you. I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I don't know what else it could be. I mean, uh, Mac, you know, the Bible teaches calls God the Almighty, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was, who is, and who is to come. There is no one before me. There's no gods before me. Uh, no one existed before me. To, to me, that is the definition of God, the starting point of everything, the maximally powerful being. So that, I, I don't know what else it could be other than God. So I, that's, I don't know really how to answer that question other than what would be the other options, I guess. And Mark, did you have anything to add? Um, other than that was just a really long argument from incredulity, nothing. And from Isa, if I'm saying that close to correct, a question for Mark. Does absolute truth exist or is it subjective? Is there truth outside of our minds or are there mind independent truths? Well, I don't think truth has to be absolute to not be subjective, right? Like I could say this is a ball python, right? And we and that comports with reality and it is true. But is it absolute? I don't know. So, I mean, tr the truth is what comports with reality. And whether or not that's absolute is, is irrelevant. If it comports with reality, it's true. And it's not really subjective. And Matt? Uh, I actually asked Mark that question earlier and. Uh, you know, my view is that if you can't demonstrate absolute truth, then I think that's another problem for atheists. And I believe, again, as a Christian, uh, we ground our truth in God. And as a Christian, Jesus Christ made the boldest statement of any religion that I know of in which he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. So Jesus actually declared himself as the truth. And I believe that Jesus Christ is the foundation for truth because he is the truth. All right. And unless something changes while this is being answered, the last question uh, authored by Free Naturalists, a question for Matt. If God is the creator of all things, did he create evil like it says in Isaiah 45, 7? I believe that God is um, the creator of all things and created the possibility for evil, the option for evil, because I believe that in order to in order for free beings to be free and to choose to love, they actually have to have the choice to be able to do evil as well. Because now, you know, in Isaiah, you could argue that the, the such thing is natural evil, like a hurricane and things like that. Now, in the Christian worldview, we believe that that's also the result of humans rejecting God, the first evil act, and then everything else came after that. But then there's the evil actions that humans do themselves. And that's what I believe that God is not responsible for because God gave man free will, the free choice to do either love or to do evil. And uh, I believe that ultimately man is responsible for evil uh, because he gave man dominion over all the world to rule over it and subdue it and to take care of it and gave man the choice to disobey God. And that is the source of evil that is the ultimate. Uh, that's where evil begins. Uh, God just gave the potential for evil. And Mark, would you have anything to say on that same topic? Yeah. Um, is there any? Does God know everything that's going to happen that I'm going to do before I do it? That's not a comment. Well, yeah. Well, I, it's just I, it's I'm going up. Okay. So if God knows everything that I'm going to do before I do it, and nothing can happen that's outside of God's will, I have no choice but to do. I have no choice but to do what God's will is. Correct. So if I'm going to do something evil, it was God's will for me to do something evil, and I couldn't have done anything differently. Very, very good. And you each get five minutes closing, starting out the same methodology as we did before, in the same order. Please go ahead and take the floor. Um. Am I first or is Mark first? I think you've been going first the whole time. Have you not, Matt? Um, actually, I, I really did prepare a closing statement other than, um, you know, I'm just going to say I had fun. It was great chatting with Matt. Um, I believe I set forth my best arguments for why it is unreasonable to believe in God based off of inerrancy in the Bible um, and uh, the fact that we can't even define what this being is. So therefore, if we can't define it, it's not reasonable to believe it. And, that, and I'll cede my time. Okay, so uh, Mark, if you'd stick around, please. Um, 
James has a few things planned. And Matt, you could go ahead with your closing statement if you have one prepared. Well, I think it was a good conversation. I think Mark was expecting me to um, be a little bit different. And I think he was pleasantly surprised. Um, and uh, I am impressed with his snake collection. I actually enjoy snakes myself, although I don't have any pet ones. I just catch them when I see them, um, as long as they're not poisonous. But uh, I think well, uh, no we had are poisonous, so you're good. Okay, well, venomous, maybe. There you venomous. go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I don't pick up vipers. Okay, so there you um, go. So, um, but I, I think it was a good conversation. I think that Mark, uh, you know, he agreed that science um, does have to change. It has to based on new information. So science is not involved in proving things, and I think that that. Um, in and of itself, you can't really use science to say, well, this is the Bible is inerrant because science uh, teaches this at the moment. I mean, science, we know, has made some major mistakes uh, in in the early years of Darwin. Afterwards, uh, scientists started actually measuring um, the size of skulls and the size of bone structure and actually determined that the Caucasian was the most advanced uh, species of human and that minor there, certain minority groups were actually closer to apes and it produced uh, dangerous ideologies such as scientific racism. Uh, so science has to adapt and change. That's what science is all about. So it's not really involved in proving or disproving scripture. And I just don't think from my viewpoint, uh, you can ever truly trust your own reasoning and own logic if you believe that th we are just, a, in essence, a cosmic random accident that brought forth all of this life that we see today without any purpose or meaning, but nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Uh, and I just think, well, if that's the case, you can't really trust whether you have reason or logic, especially if we are told by some that, um, that theism itself is a byproduct for us to better survive. But then you say theism is untrue, then that would show there's nothing important about truth. It's more about survival. So how can we even determine any of our cognitive faculties are reliable? And I believe the only reason, the only way we can uh, ground our cognitive faculties to even have reason and logic uh, to begin with is with God. And I believe once someone says, well, you know, I used to believe God exists. Now, Mark did not make this argument, but a lot of times you'll have atheists make the argument that um, God, uh, that they used to believe in God as a child, but then they learn how to reason. They learn how to logic, use logic and, and learn how to think freely. And they put away those silly ideas. But once you throw away that, it's like throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Once you say, well, I don't believe God exists anymore, then you've actually taking away any foundation for reason and logic from my perspective, because then at that, that point, you can never know whether there's any absolute truth uh, to ground reason and logic on. You can never know if you have the choice to change your mind, which would be required uh, in order for reason to exist to begin with. So that's kind of my conclusion. I enjoyed the debate and maybe we can uh, do it again sometime. <laughs> do you have a closing statement now, Mark? You are muted, sir. If Matt wants to schedule another debate on evolution, I'd be happy to do it. But I, I can't tackle all the wrong things he said about evolution in, in like two minutes. So if he wants to schedule a debate about evolution, I'm happy to do it. It's something that I can uh, speak to pretty well as, uh, you know, I, I, I study biology uh, in my spare time. But um, I'm not going to touch that right now. I turn it back over to James. James, it's all you, man. I'm gonna step Alrighty, away for two I want to first uh, thank both debaters. Um, I want to thank Richard for coming in to ask the questions while I was having technical difficulties. Um, I want to thank everybody who's watching, uh, giving me tweaks, advice, the questions. Uh, you guys help make the debate interesting uh, because of that. And uh, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Unless our debaters have anything they want to add, we'll close it out. And then there's a few people in the background, guys, who just want to ask you some questions. That'll be okay. private and off. Okay. That's fine. 
And that before I go, James, uh, since I'm not James, I can shamelessly plug you. James is a really sweet guy. Please be sure to vote on all his videos. You know, if you feel like giving it a thumbs, thumbs down, up. give it a thumbs down. But if you feel like giving a thumbs up and please consider subscribing. Thumbs up and subscribe. Thank you, guys. All right. Let's find this outro and kick it. Mm -hmm.